Um, so welcome if it's night or morning, happy to have you all here. So before we get started, if everyone can find the chat box and if you can go ahead and let us know where you're calling in from and let us know what number event this is for you. And also if you've ever lived abroad, why don't you write down where you lived? That way we can get to know each other a little bit better. So my name is Laura. I am one of the San Diego chapter leaders and one of the TNN virtual event hosts. I've been to many, many, many of these events and I studied abroad in Sevilla, Spain and I lived in Prague in the Czech Republic. So excited to see where all of you are from and where you have, um, where you have lived if you have lived abroad. So my sharing option is not working at the moment, but um, I am just gonna kind of give you a quick recap of what the Nomadic Network is all about for those of you who are new. So the Nomadic Network is a global community of like-minded travel enthusiasts who have come together to learn and inspire each other to travel better, cheaper, and longer. So we launched at the end of 2019 with in-person meetups, um, our hope was to have them in 22 different cities worldwide. We had a couple of those. And then as we all know, the pandemic hit and that led us to pivot into some virtual events. So it's actually been a wonderful blessing because now we've been able to offer a variety of different events. We have these travel presentation style events, such as the one today, where we have a speaker come and um, speak on a particular subject matter. Then we have regional happy hours where we get to connect with people in our own communities. And then we have monthly book clubs which is uh, wonderful because this is a great way to have an intimate conversation with the author about his or her book. Uh, oh, actually, I can now share my screen. Look at that. It just ended up working. Uh, so one second. And that way you guys can look at that. I don't have to see my face the whole time. Um, so if you are comfortable having your camera on, uh, feel free to do so. I see a couple of you with yours on, so thank you. And I will keep everyone muted just so we make sure we can hear our speaker, but feel free to use that chat box. This is a great place where you can you know, connect, ask your questions, share any tips or relevant experiences you may have. And then on that note, if you do have a question, if you can just write the word question first, and then that way I can keep track of all of them and I will get them answered for you at the end of the call. Please know that our speakers are doing this out of the kindness of their heart. And so we are so appreciative in advance of having Caitlin here sharing with us her wisdom and knowledge. So we're so grateful for you for being here. And we're here to learn, satiate your wanderlust, and most importantly, have fun. And then for those of you that aren't familiar, we have this community membership, which is called Nomadic Map Plus. It's a membership network. You can get some more information there on the link, but all of our replays from the events are there. So if you want to join, you have access to all of that. And I'll share a little bit more about that at the end of the call as well. And then if you haven't already followed the Nomadic Network yet on Instagram, we'd love for you to do that. You can find us at, at the.nomadic.network. And that is all I have to share regarding the Nomadic Network. And now for all you guys have been waiting for today, I'm so excited to introduce our speaker for today, Caitlin. So Caitlin has been to 78 countries and all seven continents, all by the age of 22, which is absolutely amazing. Um, and she's currently in the process of publishing a book, which is called You Are Where You Go, A Traveler's Coming of Age Journey. She has studied abroad six times across five continents while she was attending NYU. And after, during that, she was pursuing a degree in marketing and global business. After that, she went on to take on a product marketing, a product strategy role for Instagram stories. Um, and she is now planning to take a leap into full-time travel entrepreneurship. And she is currently living the digital nomad life and gonna be planning to hop around the US. So she has done so much already. I am so excited to welcome her here today and share with us all about everything she has learned and all of her wisdom. So thank you, Caitlin. I'll let you take it over from here. Yeah, thank you so much for the intro. Um, yeah, I'm super happy and excited to be here. This is my first time hosting an event with the Nomadic Network, but I've been to quite a few events myself and always find them really helpful and interesting. It's just so fun connecting with other travel lovers and especially people who kind of fall on a budget as the way I phrase this talk. Um, but yeah, I'll just go ahead and share my screen and we can get started. Um, let's see. 
cool he's floating awesome um if anyone can't see the screen or hear me let me know but yeah budget travel hacks falling on a budget all living abroad i definitely know quite a bit about this since all of my travels in the past four years or so took place while i was a college student definitely on a tight budget but wanting to maximize life and maximize my ability to see new places and explore new things um, while living abroad um as uh, was mentioned before, I studied abroad and I kind of outlined that here at the bottom of this slide. I did a full semester in Florence at NYU Florence and did a full semester in Singapore at the National University of Singapore as an exchange student. And then I also did a full winter break abroad, which was like three to five weeks in Tel Aviv and Abu Dhabi on separate occasions. And then I also spent a spring semester studying a class in the realm of global business that centered around Ghana and Peru and involved a trip with my class and my professors to those places. So I've had a lot of opportunities to actually live abroad and kind of have an address abroad and like get to know my neighborhood more so than just like traveling on a one-off trip. But a lot of these kind of travel hacks will be applicable to traveling in general, as well as kind of when you're living in a different country abroad. Um, so all these links here, if you ever wanna follow me, I'm at Caitlin Lubis on pretty much every platform and my website for my book is you are where you go as was mentioned earlier but yeah let's just get into it um so my overall kind of guidance and like mindset is that like money should never really be a barrier to travel i think it's one of the biggest misconceptions that you need to be rich or retired and have like a ton of money enable or in order to be able to travel I kind of see traveling as you can kind of trade off between three things when you decide to travel. You can trade off between money, time, and convenience. So if money is that one thing that you're trying to save the most on, you can kind of trade off on the other two things to save some money and distribute your resources in different ways. So kind of the key questions here to ask yourself are how big is your budget? Is money really that thing that you're most constrained on? Second, considering time, how flexible are you on time or the dates for your trip? Can you maybe go on weekdays versus weekends because the prices will definitely be different? Could you possibly go during like an off season or just kind of like the shoulder season for certain places when it's less touristy? Um, can you trade off on convenience? Are you willing to maybe take a budget airline, we are going to be a little bit squished in the seat and not have a lot of leg room. Are you willing to take an overnight bus, an overnight train, sleep in a hostel rather than a hotel, kind of things like that. Um, so the key kind of point here, I think, is that if you want to decrease the amount of money you're spending, you kind of need to increase your flexibility in time and increase your ability to kind of make some sacrifices on convenience. Maybe you're willing to take a little bit of a discomfort on your accommodation, your transportation, or maybe you're willing to just overall take a flight at a really odd hour, like 6 a.m. A lot of people don't take those types of flights. I've also taken flights where like, it departs from a location a little after midnight and arrives somewhere at 4 a.m. So maybe you're crazy and are willing to do things like that to get a good budget flight. Those are kind of some things to consider when working out how money should not really be a barrier to travel and making those trade-offs accordingly. Um, so again, to reiterate, I don't think money should ever be a barrier to travel. In order to travel cheaply, you just basically need to one, make sacrifices, or also be organized and resourceful. This is kind of an overarching piece of advice. I think that obviously when you travel, there's a lot of other people who want to be doing the same exact thing as you, most likely, unless you're going to some super off the beaten path location, there's probably hundreds, if not thousands of other people who want to book that same place as you, book that same flight. And it's kind of just a matter of who gets to it first in a lot of cases, a lot of flights, a lot of accommodations, a lot of even kind of with like transportation, the cheap ones with the lowest pricing tend to get sold out first. So the early break gets the worm really does apply in that case. So I think if you can decide pretty early on that you want to go on a trip and then start booking those things that fill up first, like your flight, your accommodation, your maybe your bus tickets. Um, some of these things often get sold in different tiers or in the case of accommodation, the cheap Airbnbs or cheaper hostels will just get booked up first. So that's something to keep in mind that can definitely pay real money in savings in your pocket if you just plan and stay advanced and organize yourself early on. And then I would say also just overarchingly, Keep in mind that you can definitely be resourceful. So basically what I mean by this is 
if you see a hotel or an Airbnb or a flight or anything that you're interested in purchasing, don't just jump the gun and purchase that thing. Do a little bit of extra research, maybe Google alternative flights. Maybe always keep in mind that like if you're using a search engine like Google Flights, there's a few airlines such as Southwest, for example, in the US that don't appear on those flights. So take the extra time to actually look at all of your different resources, maybe look for discount codes online, see if you can get some sort of like discount link, just do a little bit of Google searching and that can pay off in tens, hundreds of dollars in some cases. Um, so two main takeaways overarchingly would be stay organized and plan in advance and be resourceful, put in that little bit of extra time to do your research and make sure you are getting the best deal possible. Um, also on that point, you could check that anything you're purchasing isn't already maybe included on some sort of like rewards program that you're part of, whether you kind of use different like online services that check for free things or discounts, or if you have maybe a deal with your bank or your credit cards that will give you cash back on certain things, make sure to maximize those overarchingly to save that money when you want to ball on a budget. Um, so to kind of get into some more tactical advice about specific topics, um, I think one thing I've really learned how to do well is how to really finesse it with budget airlines. I have taken so many budget airlines, whether they are in the US or in Europe, kind of, you get the ones in the US like Frontier and Spirit, um, the ones in Europe that I took a lot were like Ryanair and um, when it existed, Wow Air before I went out of business. Um, then in Southeast Asia, a bunch of different carriers all can kind of get flights in the tens of dollars range. It's, it seemed really unbelievable to me when I went abroad for the first time and I studied abroad in Florence, that you could actually get a flight from one country to another for less than a bus ticket from like New York to Philadelphia. Like that just blew my mind that you can buy a flight sometimes for like $10 or the cheapest flight that I ever bought was actually $2, like two US dollars. I flew from Milan, which is known as one of the cheapest or one of the busiest airports in Europe. I flew from Milan to Poland for $2 because I had gotten a random like flight alert deal from Ryanair. So just keeping in mind that things like this are possible with budget airlines, that's just like something to keep in mind that I wasn't aware of until I went abroad for the first time. But once you book a budget airline flight, it's definitely important to make sure that they don't kind of squeeze the money out of you through these hidden fees that they like to include. So for example, the first point here around baggage, most budget airlines don't allow you to take a carry-on most of the time, I'll just say like a personal item, which is something that fits under the seat in front of you. I was able to do this on all of my short trips around Europe and around Southeast Asia by just like rolling all my clothes really tightly and thinning it into a backpack, not like a giant backpack, but a tiny one that fits into the seat. Um, I would also say overarchingly, be very sure to follow the instructions on the emails that budget airlines tend to send you. Um, they'll actually, they have to tell you in advance if they're going to charge a fee. So definitely read the fine print. And I've seen in the past, like if you are taking a Ryanair flight and you don't print your boarding pass before you get to the airport, maybe you'd have to pay to get it printed at the airport then. Or if you are going to bring a carry-on bag, it's often cheaper if you pay for the carry-on bag in advance as opposed to paying for it. When you get to the airport, you could save like five, 10, 20 bucks, even 30 bucks sometimes doing that. So just overarchingly make sure to read the instructions because they are legally obligated to tell you things that they might charge you for. So definitely don't just trash those emails. Take a good read. Um, finally, setting price alerts, I think is one of the best ways I've been able to really pounce on some deals for budget airlines and just any flights in general. If you use different like kind of flight aggregator or search engines, like I usually use Google Flights, but anything like Kayak um, or any of the other ones out there will most likely offer you the same option to kind of set a price alert when a flight that you want either decreases or increases in price and you can get those emails and book it automatically. You can also sign up for emails from the budget airlines themselves. And I often get emails nowadays that are like $20 fares just added or like $45 and under like new routes just added and things like that. Obviously when budget airlines add these new flights, add these new routes, they want to get people into them. and that lowest tier that they advertise in the email is going to be the seats that go first. And then after that, they'll be more and more expensive until the airline can start making money back. So just keep that in mind if you do have price alerts on or like email alerts for any of the budget airlines that you're thinking about traveling on. 
definitely click those emails ASAP when you see them roll in because it generally is a first come first serve type of situation on the cheap flights. Uh, moving on, I think one of the ways I was able to save a lot of money when I was living and kind of traveling on weekend trips abroad, especially in Europe and even Southeast Asia, um, I was really able to make overnight buses work for me. Um, I think it's actually one of the greatest travel hacks is taking an overnight bus because not only are you saving your waking hours and like not taking time during the day to be on a flight or to be on a train, but you're also saving money on a night of accommodation because you're sleeping on the bus. So it's kind of a double win there, um, but there's definitely some things to consider because the first time I went on an overnight bus, I was not able to sleep, did not really know what seat to pick, and kind of going to give you some advice so that maybe you don't make those same mistakes that I did. Um, so the first one I would say is come prepared. Some of the essentials that I've kind of learned over the years to bring on an overnight bus would be like some sort of eye cover or sleep mask so you can actually sleep even if there's like lights on in the bus. Um, some sort of blanket. I feel like they're always really cold, especially if you happen to sit next to one of the AC units on the bus. So always bring like sweatpants or a blanket, kind of similar to what you would bring on a plane because planes tend to be pretty cold as well. Um, definitely bring earplugs. There can sometimes be like crying babies or just like people who don't want to sleep and just talk the entire night. Um, also bring a pillow if you definitely need that. I think it's super helpful even to just like roll up a sweatshirt if you want to kind of save on things that you're packing, just use that to sleep. Um, and food for the journey. Um, very often an overnight bus, at least in Europe, I, in my experience, it'll stop at like McDonald's or something along the way. But if you bring food in advance to kind of snack on, you can also save some money there. Um, secondly, picking your seat strategically, I think is super important with a, like a, a budget or overnight bus. Um, so if you are traveling in a group, it can work in your favor because you can grab the whole back row of the bus or a whole row kind of to yourself and with your friends. So you know that you won't be with people who are kind of messy or going to be talking on the phone or crazy things like that. So picking your seat strategically and maybe even sitting next to someone else who looks like they're also going to sleep could be a good strategic move there rather than sitting next to someone who might be blabbing to a friend or blabbing on the phone the whole time and preventing you from getting a good night of sleep. Finally, I've made this mistake once before and just happened to wake up at the right time, but set an alarm on your phone. If you do take an overnight bus that has multiple different stops, not all of them just have like the one destination. Sometimes like I think I was taking an overnight bus from Florence to, I think my final destination was like Berlin, but it stopped at another couple cities in Austria and Germany on the way. Um, and so if I hadn't set an alarm at the right time, I might have had a woken up in time and I might have overslept and ended up in the wrong city. So that's definitely something important to keep in mind because the bus may run early or may run late. So give yourself some wiggle room there. Um, but overall, I definitely would recommend overnight buses. I think a large amount of the travel that I did in Europe was on an overnight bus and occasionally on an overnight train. I did find in general that overnight buses were cheaper and they also happen to usually be more in the center of a city since the train station kind of needs more like infrastructure to exist whereas a bus can kind of just pull up right in the most convenient locations so that's something i would keep in mind as well when maybe choosing between the two finally um or not finally the next point um choosing airbnbs and hostels i had never stayed in a hostel before i lived abroad for the first time and was going on weekend trips not really wanting to pay for a hotel or like do the kind of travel that I had done with my family, but I just wanted to get out there and meet people, stay in as cheap of an accommodation as possible. Um, I had no idea before I went abroad and went to hostels for the first time that you can truly stay in a hostel, especially in Southeast Asia for as little as like five to six to seven dollars a night in some places. Um, but definitely I've learned over the years that there are some things to look out for and the cheapest one might not always be the best option. Um, so some things to keep in mind when you are looking for budget accommodation options, whether it's on Airbnb or hostels, um, definitely read the reviews. I would be very wary of any place, especially on Airbnb, that doesn't have any reviews at all. This could mean that it is just a new listing and maybe they're offering a discounted price because they want to get that first review. But it could also just mean it's like a totally fake listing. Like I had a, not myself, but some of my friends had a situation where they booked an Airbnb with no reviews. They showed up to London being ready to check into their Airbnb and the address just like did not exist or like there was no actual like accessible house at the address. So if there were prior reviews, they could have avoided that situation. Um, also, generally, if you're not aware, 
hostelworld.com is a great place to actually check reviews and make sure there's recent reviews for whatever hostel you're looking to stay at. I've seen reviews before that kind of warn like, hey, don't stay here. There's been a recent bed bug outbreak or like, hey, this is actually pretty unsafe. Someone that I know in this group that I was staying with had something stolen from them. So reading the reviews can be a really great way to get trust and assurance from other people who have been there themselves about the place that you are potentially going to go to. So definitely always place a lot of trust and uh, guidance on your decision making on where to stay on reviews, I would say. Um, another thing to keep in mind, I have once or twice booked a very cheap hostel that was significantly cheaper than other ones. But overall, in my budget, it ended up being a pretty poor decision because it took me a lot of money in terms of transportation or taxi costs or just like getting to and from the hostel if it's located very very far outside the city center it could end up taking a lot more money in terms of taxis or it could just end up taking a lot more time and maybe if you are somewhere for only a weekend trip or a long weekend you might not want to spend an hour or more getting to and from your hostel so again that trade-off between time money and convenience you have to decide if like the cheaper hostel is worth that time and that lack of convenience for you um, and keep in mind that transportation costs adding up can actually make the hostel more expensive than one that's located in the city center where you can just walk very easily to access all the things you would want to see. And then finally, one thing other that I've learned is, especially when you're traveling in a group, maybe with a partner or a group of three or four or some finite amount, you can check if the hostel has private rooms available for that amount of people. Because sometimes instead of staying in a dorm where each of you would pay, let's say like $18 for a bunk bed, you could stay in a private room where as a whole, you would stay the two of you or three of you for like the equivalent price of a dorm room, but you would actually get your own space, feel a little bit safer, feel a little more comfortable. So that's something to always keep in mind and kind of cross check the pricing per person there. Finally, last main points. Um, I think one of the other major ways to kind of ball on a budget, but also make sure you're still getting a really thorough experience of a place. I would say always keep in mind that pretty much every major city when you travel is gonna have some free walking tour of some sort. I've done this all over Europe, in many Asian cities, and then definitely all over South America as well. Um, you can usually just Google like free walking tours, whatever your city name you're in. And some of them will take place on certain days of the week, especially if there are certain ones about like maybe a certain walking tour for like a specific neighborhood of Buenos Aires only occurs on Tuesdays. Or maybe this one specific tour about the history of the city only occurs on Wednesdays. But generally, any day of the week that you're there, there'll be some like generic walking tour that'll show you the main places in the city, as well as kind of highlight the main bits of culture. I think that's one of the best ways to get the most bang for your buck, because generally all they ask you to do is be willing to tip your tour guide on a pay what you wish basis. And I've had tour guides that completely blew it out of the water, like showed us to amazing kind of hole in the wall recommendations for where to eat and where to drink kind of off the beaten path and have actually given so much context that it makes me have an even greater appreciation for the city or the country I'm traveling to. And solely because of that walking tour, I have a greater love for that place. Um, so in those cases, I end up tipping pretty generously. But if you also didn't really feel like you had a great experience or if you're just actually genuinely very, very tight on money, there's been situations where friends and I were not able to tip more than like $5 and that's totally okay too. They do generally have large tour groups and it's a great way to also meet other people when you are traveling perhaps by yourself. Um, a second option for a way to really kind of make stretch your dollars the most and if you're on a budget, how to actually go and live abroad is look into things like Workaway or um, similar to Workaway, there's programs called Woofing or W-W-O-O-F for Woof. Um, these are basically opportunities where you can live and also put in some hours of work on usually some sort of farm type of situation. Sometimes it's also just like in an accommodation where the owners need help, like watching their kids or watching their dog or washing dishes and doing household chores. Definitely nothing in terms of like super skilled labor, just like household type of chores is generally um, what they're asking for. But in these situations, like a work away, you can actually live with locals, get to like really have that cultural exchange while also kind of earning your way towards a free accommodation. And this is especially helpful if you're trying to live somewhere for an extended period of time, like let's say more than a week or two, a couple months even. Um, it can be a really great way to help finance that ability for you to explore a new country while also getting to have a natural personal relationship with a local. 
And then finally, on this overall tips for balling on a budget, I am a huge fan of walking everywhere when I travel. I think that walking through a city and kind of immersing yourself in the over overhearing different conversations and like walking through local markets and not just opting to take a bus or take an Uber or take some sort of form of transportation where you're a little more far removed from like the hustle and bustle of the city. You get to learn so much more and immerse yourself so much more. You will just take these strolls through the city and really get to also save money because you won't be paying for anything in that case. All you have to really sacrifice on there is like the convenience um, going back to those three things that you can always make trade-offs between. Um, so yeah, I think these would be some of my major tips for how to still maximize your cultural immersion while minimizing the amount of money you spend. So that pretty much sums up my major tips kind of covering budget airlines, overnight buses, choosing cheap accommodations, whether it's an Airbnb or a hostel, and then overarchingly kind of like the mindsets and tips to keep in mind when you want to travel abroad or live abroad, uh, but you want to keep yourself on a tight budget. Um, and just to plug my book a bit, um, as was mentioned before, I've been to 70 countries or in the span of college, I went to 70 countries, but I've been to 78 outside of that, um, all seven continents. And most of my travels happened during three years of college. So my book explores how I kind of set that right mindset and how did I get this inspiration and the ability to travel through prioritizing travel above all else. And it also explores each of the chapters is a different story of how I went to a specific place, kind of experienced personal development by letting everywhere I went kind of become a part of me, hence the title, You Are Where You Go, kind of a traveler's take on You Are What You Eat. So if that at all sounds interesting to you, um, you can actually scan this to not only receive $5 off my book, which is currently on pre-sale, but you can also get a copy of the slides here today. So I'll leave this on the screen for a hot second. And if you have any questions, feel free to get ready to ask them or you can type them in the chat. But yeah, I'm definitely happy to talk about anything in the realm of travel and especially budget travel kind of on a student or general budget. <laughs> Caitlin, this was amazing. Like I said earlier, I can't believe how much you have already done and you just have such this world vision. It's amazing. So I love it. I can't wait to see how much more you do moving forward with this. So yes, definitely um, everyone grab that QR code. Um, this is, I'm so excited. And when did you say your book is launching again? So my pre-sale launched last Friday and it'll be available for pre-sale um, until August 22nd. And then the book is fully coming out this fall on November 23rd. And it's kind of fun because I just turned 23. So the pre-sale launched in July 23rd and it'll be coming out on November 23rd. <laughs> Yay, that's perfect. I love it. All right, so we've got a couple questions. If anyone else has any, just feel free to drop them in the chat and we'll get them answered. Um, so the first one is from MJ. So no one actually answered this. So we're gonna ask you if you have your thought on what your favorite small backpack for one bag travel might be. So currently they're using an Osprey Porter 46, but was thinking about a 35 liter backpack plus messenger bag. So curious what you've used and if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, definitely. I think when I was actually traveling in Europe, I actually used, um, what was it called? I think, I don't know the exact model, but it was a, like a general like Herschel backpack that would like fit under a seat when I was going on the very, very budget airlines, like Ryanair specifically doesn't even let you bring a carry on unless you want to pay. So for like a personal item, I think just any kind of large, even like typical Jansport size backpack, you can fit a lot more than you think if you roll your clothes really tight. And if you're only going for like three to four days, you can make it work. Um, in general though, especially when I was traveling around Southeast Asia and would go for more like almost a week long trip. Um, I used a backpack from the brand Nomadic spelled N-O-M-A-D-I-C. And I love that backpack. It has kind of a top compartment and a bottom compartment as well as like, a, it opens like a clamshell in the middle, which I know these days a lot of backpacks do that. I would definitely recommend getting one that opens sideways. So you can kind of pack it strategically the way you want it to rather than kind of like top down in a backpack. Um, I really love my bag from Nomadic and use it for basically two years straight. And then very, very recently, I did get an Osprey that I don't know the exact model of, but it's one of the ones that basically has like a like a personal item size backpack that you zip onto the larger size, like carry on size backpack. So if you're on some sort of flight situation where they tell you you can only bring one bag, 
Um, you can technically bring that one, but then still like unzip the personal item one and stick it under your seat, which is really nice. Um, and in general as well, I've kind of found that even if your backpack is bigger or heavier than the restrictions that are stated by the airline, if it's a backpack, it's a very, very less chance that they're going to actually weigh it compared to if you bring like a rolling luggage because they just assume that it can't possibly be that heavy, even if you are packing it very, very heavy. Um, and I've also, I don't know if any girls out there have long hair. Sometimes I just like use my hair to like hide the straps of the backpack. And if it's small enough that it fits behind you, like sometimes they don't even know. So there's another hack. <laughs> That is so smart. A lot of times I'll just kind of put it off to the side, right? And that way they do turn a yeah. certain way that they don't see it. <laughs> I love it though with the long hair. Need to keep growing mine out. Um, all right. So we've got a question from Caroline. So what are some tips you have for safety, both as a woman and then within regards to COVID and just general travel? Yeah. Um, in terms of safety, I, I have not traveled too much by myself. I know it's definitely a huge concern, especially for like solo female travel. Um, I would say in general, for me to feel safe, I always have like, always have cell service. I think that's the number one thing. Like, even if you're trying to like be on a budget, I would never say skip buying a SIM card. I think it's always really, really important to be able to contact people when you're in a new place. Um, so definitely always opting for some sort of access to local cell service, whether maybe if you're from the US and you have T-Mobile, I know that works pretty well abroad and is cost-free. Um, but if you are on a plan like Verizon, like what I have, I was definitely not about to pay all the international fees for roaming abroad and found that it was actually fairly cheap and easy to just get a local SIM card wherever I was to make sure I could always contact someone in case of emergency. So that was a major thing that I did in order to feel safe. Um, and in terms of COVID safety, I have been opting to like, just not go to any countries where the vaccination rate is low, or if there is like a large increase in cases, just to be like overly cautious and to also be considerate of not wanting to like insert myself into a different kind of healthcare system that might be just more fragile than we have in the US or even certain parts of the US. Um, so, let me go back as well to like general safety. I think like obviously traveling with a buddy always makes it feel a little bit safer. Um, I have done one or two trips by myself and just made sure that as soon as I got to my hostel, I kind of like tried to make friends with other people and like didn't end up just going out by myself. Um, and I think as a girl as well, especially like a young girl, when I was abroad for the first time, I was only 19. Um, I tended to not like go out at night. Like I wouldn't go out like to bars and clubs and things because I didn't super feel comfortable with that. I instead opted to like sleep early and get up early to see more of the city. Um, those are just like some personal like sacrifices and like guidance that I have done in my time to feel safe. Perfect. All right. Thank you for sharing all of that. All right, we've got another question from MJ. And actually, Carla, I believe, um, mentioned one way that she did this, but love to hear from you. So he was denied boarding at JFK by a Korean Airlines because they didn't have a return ticket, was going by train to Malaysia. So do you find that you need an onward or, you know, or a return ticket to be allowed to fly in those situations? Carla had answered that she has... Um, bought a return ticket and then just canceled it 24 hours before or you know afterwards so you don't aren't charged for it so that's a good tip um just wasn't sure if you've had any other scenarios regarding that or any other thoughts yeah i have not personally experienced that um i think at least for me since most of my like trips abroad occurred when i was like living in italy and then traveling in and out of italy on like the weekend trip or living in singapore and traveling in and out of singapore I usually did have a return ticket of some sort, but when I have gone on longer trips that involved like multiple countries, like one to the other, um, I think if I've ever been asked that, I was able to just like present the train ticket or the bus ticket to show I am like leaving the country. But yeah, that's also another good um, idea to just like go to the airport, maybe book a book an outward bound flight like that same day, show it to like customs and then just like cancel it. Cause I think I think it depends on the country, but at least in the U.S., I know um, any flight that you book within 24 hours, you can still cancel it. Exactly. I think it's a good tip. You just got to put that alarm on to make sure you yeah. don't forget to cancel it for sure. Um, all right. Ali has a couple of good questions. All right. Back to that. So the first one is, 
Have you been to a destination where you thought it was expensive, but it ended up being budget friendly? Hmm. Um, I think overall, when a trip ends up being budget friendly, it usually is just because I'm able to split the cost of things with multiple people. Like, honestly, that is one of the best ways to actually be able to budget and save money when you travel, especially if you're traveling solo, like go to a hostel, meet up with other people and be able to like split the cost of going in a taxi to somewhere, be able to split the cost of maybe renting a car, be able to split the cost of kind of buying groceries or things in bulk. Like, I think that has been the major deciding factor of like, if I'm in a group or if I'm able to meet up with a group, because sometimes there's like one-off expenses that could be split between multiple people that, especially even like sometimes the most expensive, like purchase I think that you can sometimes have on a trip is just like your taxi to and from the airport especially if you get in at an odd hour and like you're not able to take public transit because it might not be running at like 4 a.m or midnight um I think there's definitely been countries where like the airport ride to and from ends up being the most money I've spent the whole trip um so I would say like traveling with people is more the determining factor not necessarily like my perception of a country being cheap and then it ending up not being um I think in general because like I tend to do a decent amount of research before I go to a place I have a pretty good understanding of like what is the cost of living somewhere and like I kind of budget my like mental model of like how much will I probably spend here accordingly um but there's definitely been places where I've been able to like find a really good um like local market where I can get food for super cheap and that ends up like drastically reducing my costs um, I'm kind of struggling to think of a place that I thought was cheap, but ended up being expensive. Because I, I think like, in terms of the general cost of living, you can generally get a really good sense of that online, but it's going to be more like mishaps that make a trip end up being more expensive. Like, I think when my friends and I were in Germany, we got fined for like, not understanding how to use the subway properly. And that ended up being like $200. So things like that obviously make a country or a trip more expensive than you expect. But can't think of any instance off the top of my head where that's like a blanket situation. It's hard to think about it, but as long as you are budgeting, I think in planning and doing your research, like you said, you might not run into those issues so much. So um, that's smart. Good for you. All right. So MJ um, used hostel, hostel dorm rooms before COVID, but now not so much interested in doing that. So have curious, have you been traveling solo at all since 2020? I have not traveled solo per se. Like I have traveled to a place by myself where I was able to thankfully like meet up with a friend or meet up with someone that I knew from like an online community and be able to like stay with them or like find an accommodation to split with someone. So I have not actually encountered having to travel solo in the past year or so. Um, but I would say like, for example, I'm actually planning a trip to Seattle in like two weeks and was looking for a place to stay for me and a friend. And we were kind of considering hostels, but kind of opted against it due to COVID. And we actually kind of found that Airbnbs are a lot cheaper than we would have expected. I think because a lot of people will realize that a lot of people want Airbnbs or people also maybe just wanted an extra income stream in the past year it seems like there's a lot of newer listings on Airbnb like it'll say like someone joined like earlier this year and started listing their property earlier this year um so to kind of offset the cost of not going to a hostel I think I've at least in my experience have seen that there's a lot more cheaper Airbnbs that you could book for like two people or even one person as opposed to staying at a hostel if you're concerned about kind of like living in a dorm room with all of the things going on with COVID. Yes, that totally makes sense. All right, um, Romy or Romy, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. It's curious, how do you deal with the money situation when you're traveling with others? So if you're splitting the cost, you know, you would probably need local currency. So how do you go about handling that in those situations? Yeah, um, I have found that I'm just able, or I usually, if I was like living in a country in a certain region, like when I was living in Singapore, for example, um, I would be able to go to like a money exchange place right before I took a trip and be able to exchange the currency kind of cheaply. Um, or obviously if you're living in a place like Europe where there's like pretty much a common currency, that's much easier as well. Um, but dealing with money in terms of just like splitting the cost with others in general, um, 
I usually use an app called Splitwise or another one called TriCount, which are both really good at just tracking different expenses. And you can actually input the cost in different currencies. So also really helpful, not only if you're traveling with people from different countries who like register their own expenses in different currencies, but also if you're going on like a multi-country trip, you can put in expenses into Splitwise, um, like some from Zimbabwe and like some from Tanzania, even if they're different currencies. And you can just settle up at the end by like running everything through our converter. And like, if you are both from the US, you can use Venmo. If you're both from different countries, you can probably use PayPal. Um, or I know there's a service called Revolut that I think is more popular in Europe to send money, I think free or at least very low fees um, to other people from other countries. So that's some of the ways that you can kind of get around that in terms of splitting costs and paying back people who might have different currencies. Awesome suggestions, thank you. Yeah, you gotta make sure you are being fair with all of your fellow travelers, right? <laughs> um, so I actually had a couple of questions. So I was curious, you mentioned the overnight buses. So where did you do that? Was that mainly in Europe or where? Yeah, um, I think that the most buses I ended up taking was definitely in Europe. Um, I, I lived in Florence, like basically a 15 minute walk from the main station called Santa Maria Novella. And it was not only a train station, but also like a bus station where specifically this company Flix Bus. I feel like they are all over Europe and they're probably one of my like most frequented brands throughout the like five months I lived in Italy. Cause I feel like I took a Flix Bus like at least once a week <laughs> if I wasn't flying. Um, and yeah, I took a lot of buses in Europe because everything is really easy in terms of like, there's no necessarily like different borders to cross most of the time. Um, it's much easier to just like take a bus from the center of the city to the next center of the city rather than dealing with trains being a little bit farther out. Um, but I also did take overnight buses in South America. I took some from Argentina into Chile and worked out for the be fine. Um, also took overnight buses from like the north of Argentina down back to Buenos Aires. Uh, I took overnight buses in Cambodia, not between different countries, but from one part of Cambodia to another, as well as from one part of Myanmar to another. And the ones in Southeast Asia definitely surprised me because instead of having like the normal seats on a bus, they actually had like bunk beds where you would lie flat on the floor and then also have like a top bunk where you lie flat and all that was really like protecting you from possibly rolling off and like falling to the floor it was like a small little chain across the top. So you definitely get the feeling that you're on a budget travel type of situation with those types of overnight buses. And when we were reading reviews for different ones, um, one of the reviews had specifically said like, in Cambodia, take this specific overnight bus company because the other one has a track record of like the bus tipping over and like crazy things like that. So definitely another plug to always read the reviews and take other people's advice. Yes, so true. So I'm curious, though, it sounds like you've done you know, a lot of bus travel everywhere across the world. Have you taken many um, trains? I know you've done flights, obviously, but what about trains? I've taken an overnight train once or twice, I believe, only in Europe. Um, I think I took it from like Prague to Budapest with one of my friends. And she actually had a really bad experience on an overnight train. We were like actually in a, in a whatever it's called, like a, a cabin, whatever you call it on the train, where like she and I were sitting on one side and like we were facing in the other train, in the train car, like this other man who was like sleeping and facing us. And we were both kind of like sleeping and like kind of hugging our backpacks so that like no one would be able to touch it even if we were asleep. But somehow in the middle of the night, like someone got into my friend's backpack and like took her wallet out of the backpack. Um, and I have never personally had that happen on an overnight bus because everyone puts their bags like under the bus or like you are sitting in your seat and someone can't just like be in the same little car as you or like walk in and out of all the different cars and like get away very easily because it's very obvious on an overnight bus, I feel like if someone is like walking up and down the aisles randomly and like peeking in different places, but no one's necessarily like able to see the whole train at once in the same way. Um, so I have personally not had great experiences with overnight trains, just from that one experience, uh, obviously probably was just a bit of bad luck as well, but I have never had a bad experience with an overnight bus. So for me, I usually opt for buses for those various reasons. Such a good point. I never thought about that because you're right. So many people can walk up and down the train and you're not used to seeing all those people because there's so many cars. Um, and I will give one little tip for a train one time when we were going from Germany to Prague, but um, 
the train split and we were on the wrong car. And so our car continued going all the way up. We were in Munich, went all the way up to Hamburg instead of going to Prague. So make sure when you reserve the train, you're in the right car that's going to the right location where you could get stuck. Um, all right, so we've got a great question more about how you kind of got into all of this with your NYU um, studies. So uh, DD, I'm not sure if that's um, the correct name, but it's curious how far in advance you planned your trips and classes and how you balanced your coursework with your exploration. Yeah, um, so how far in advance? Um, I basically, I knew that at the, when I was nearing the end of high school, I knew that I wanted to go to a university that would allow me to travel and study abroad more than once, because um, not every school lets you do that. So I definitely prioritize at least ones that would let me spend at least two semesters abroad, if not even counting all the other opportunities over winter break and spring break to take classes that incorporated trips. Um, so NYU was definitely one of them up there. I also considered some schools like Northeastern where they have like different summer programs or different things to go abroad. But basically in my freshman year, I took one spring semester course where we got to travel to Ghana and like work with a village that I'm actually still working with to this day because it's a long-term partnership, which is great. Um, and that trip to Ghana during my freshman year when I was 18, kind of like put this idea in my head that if I can get to a place like Ghana, like a place that I never really imagined myself being able to visit when I was just like sitting around in my bedroom in New Jersey as a kid, like imagining me being able to travel to kind of more typical destinations, I guess. Um, I it put into my head that, okay, if I can get to Ghana, I feel like I can get to all seven continents and as many countries as possible. And I'm just going to set this goal for myself. And I remember kind of thinking through this and setting that goal when I was staying overnight in this mud hut in the middle of this rural village in Ghana. And then over the next couple of years um, during college, I was able to really just manifest that by being very strategic in what kind of courses I took. So I think basically as a freshman near the end of my freshman year, I decided that I wanted to not only study abroad two times, but also incorporate like winter break trips, incorporate classes that involve the spring break trip. And just like, also I had a goal to graduate early so that I would have not just like a summer before I started working, but seven full months. And unfortunately, that seven months for me ended up being in 2020, which is possibly the worst year to plan a seven month trip. But um, yeah, in terms of how far I planned in college, definitely, if you can figure it out earlier on, it'll benefit you. But I do know friends as well who decided they wanted to start traveling more and studying abroad kind of even at the end of their second year of school, and they were still able to make that happen. It's more of just a matter of when you do go on a semester abroad, how are you maximizing your weekends? Kind of how do you juggle different things at the same time? I was always using my time at the airport or my time on a flight to be like doing readings or like filling in homework or just like submitting things at the oddest hours of the day. But definitely was still able to keep on top of my studies. Like I still graduated at the top of my class, even despite all the traveling and the seemingly distractions along the way. Um, but yeah, I think it's all a matter of like prioritizing, just being really, really good at managing your time if you are going to study abroad and travel while still completing schoolwork or while working a job. Caitlin, did you say you were attempting to end your study seven, seven months early? Yeah, so I, I was in the class of 2020 and I graduated a semester early in the fall or winter of 2019. So after I graduated and finished all my classes in December of 2019, I had seven months of free time before my full-time job was gonna be starting in August. So I had originally planned this elaborate, like I called it my expedition seven and seven in my head. I was like, I'm going to visit all seven continents in seven months. And that was originally what I wanted to be able to write a book about, kind of this unique experience of visiting so many different places in a very condensed period of time. So I'd be able to give a lot of perspective on like the synthesis and like comparing and contrasting so many disparate places. But so I started out in January going to Antarctica and then backpacking through Argentina and Chile and Patagonia. And then I was in the middle of a six week safari when COVID kind of hit and all the borders around the world started closing. So I actually flew home from Zimbabwe and did not get to complete the rest of my seven month trip. I would have, if COVID hadn't happened, I would have gone on to Singapore, Sri Lanka, Nepal for a Mount Everest base camp trek, and then visiting friends all over Europe and visiting friends all over Australia to kind of wrap it up in July, but that'll all have to happen one day in the future. 
I was just amazed that you were able to do that with still doing so many study abroad programs while you were there and still ending early. So it's just amazing to me. Yeah. You, are, you are amazing. Um, right. A lot of long nights to make that all possible. <laughs> I'm sure. But I mean, look at the adventures you've had and the experiences. It's all worth it. Definitely. Mm -hmm. So I love it. Uh, McKinley has a question about how many language languages are you comfortable speaking? Not enough. Honestly, I wish I was so much more comfortable in so many languages. Um, so when I studied abroad in Italy, I was required to take a advanced Italian course. It was not that advanced. Um, I think I got to the point where I could comfortably hold a conversation. Like I had to give presentations somewhat in Italian, but I had, before I went to Italy, during kind of like grade school had studied Spanish for around 12 years. So I feel like I know Spanish very well to the point where if you gave me a book in Spanish, I could probably get through it. But holding a conversation in the present day in Spanish is very difficult just because I'm so out of practice. Um, and after having taken Italian, I feel like Spanish and Italian are so similar that I actually end up like mixing the two languages together. And now I'm just worse at both for having known both. Um, so TLDR is I don't know many languages well besides Spanish. Um, I know a bit of Italian kind of can infer my way through French and Portuguese because they're just romance languages. Um, my mom's from the Philippines, so I know like a tiny bit of Tagalog and my dad is Polish, so I know like how to sing happy birthday in Polish, for example, but that's not very useful. <laughs> Enough to get by though, right? A little bit. Yeah. yeah. I will say I've definitely used apps like Duolingo to just like kind of study up really quick before I go on my trip. And even like when I was taking overnight buses to different places, I would just like briefly look through like how to say like, hello, and where's the bathroom and things like that. And I think even if you are aiming to speak to locals, even just being able to like have those few phrases down and be able to say like thank you in their language even is a nice little gesture to say like hey I'm not just coming in and like taking I'm actually trying to also have some sort of cultural exchange and appreciation for where I'm going. Agree I think it makes such a difference and even if we try and they respond back in English whatever at least we yeah. talk to them and they're appreciative of it as well so exactly um, I think I have gotten through all the questions if I missed any feel free you guys to jot, jot them down and I'll get them asked, but I just want to end with one last one. I'm curious on all your travels, do you have a favorite location you've been to? Oh, that's a really tough one. I feel like that's honestly the hardest question that anyone can ask, just given the range of places I've been. Um, honestly, though, I think because of how long I had ex been excited to go and just like how mind-blowingly unique it was, I loved Antarctica. And I think adding to the overall like uniqueness of it I especially love penguins I think they're like my favorite animal and even before I went to Antarctica kind of if you had asked me this question maybe four years ago my favorite place had been Alaska and then a few years after that my favorite place had been Iceland so I have always been partial to these like glacial landscapes I think they're just like very otherworldly and so incredible um so I would say like that's definitely up there um and I see in the chat someone also asked do we do I always buy travel insurance um I, the only time I've ever bought travel insurance was in 2020, which is so funny because obviously it was super useful that year. Um, I had bought travel guard insurance for my like seven month trip and I ended up getting all of that money back. So for all the flights, all the tours that I wasn't able to go on, I got a check for $9,000 in the mail from travel guard. So definitely would highly recommend. <laughs> That's huge. It's so important. And I mean, a lot of the times, you know, when you used to get travel insurance, you might not need to use it. But nowadays, I think it's so important as we learn. Yeah. Um, you're lucky you got it back because I know sometimes it can be pretty tricky. Yeah. So Amanda had a question. I was curious too about how did you organize going to Antarctica? Because I know you can fly or you can take the boat. Yeah. What did you do? So there are two options. Like the flying option, one not only is like slightly dangerous, but also I think it's a little like unenvironmentally friendly just because like obviously putting a lot of like carbon and like pollution through a plane um to get there um so i took a boat uh you can take a boat from either the tip of chile or the tip of argentina so i went from the argentina side um ushuaia is the name of like the southernmost city in the world i took a ship of about like 150 people capacity through a, an organization called ocean wide expeditions and i specifically had booked onto one of their like learning and discovery ships. So all of the adventure or like expedition guides were 
either PhDs in biology or PhDs in glaciology and knew a lot about penguins and whales and lichen and all of these things that make Antarctica so unique. And in addition to kind of like leading us through the actual excursions on the continent, we were also able, when we were kind of like in transit and in the ocean, we were able to get lectures from all these super knowledgeable people. So I learned like how to identify a penguin, how to identify different whales, like what are the different things and like why are glaciers blue? Um, kind of learning all this firsthand from people who are super, super knowledgeable about the subject was one of the best things about my trip. So it's definitely focus on learning and I would highly recommend ocean-wide expeditions to get to Antarctica. What an amazing experience. So I've got to ask, I've heard it's pretty rough when you're crossing. So was it, was it terribly rough, <laughs> the seas? Um, so yeah, the Drake Passage, which is the body of water between the tip of South America and kind of the Antarctic Peninsula, is definitely known as being like the roughest seas in the world. I got so lucky, apparently. Um, I still felt like it was the worst experience on a boat I had ever experienced. Like, I remember that one day where we were like in the midst of it all. I was just like, I'm not getting up. I'm sitting in bed. My stomach is all over the place. But apparently that was still like one of the most smooth passages they've ever seen. So I cannot imagine how much worse it would be. Um, like the captain of my ship had shown us like a video from a prior trip where they had 40 foot waves rocking the boat back and forth. And in like the dining room, they had had to use kind of like super weighted down cups and plates to make sure things weren't just flying off the tables. Um, so that's what can happen with the Drake Passage. I did not personally experience that. Um, the way they phrased it to me was like, normally you get the Drake shake, but you guys got the Drake lake in the Drake Passage. So got super lucky and I can't speak to how it normally is. <laughs> oh my gosh, you did get really lucky. I've heard it's pretty crazy. And I was gonna say, I know the other option for flying is crazy expensive. So I do not think that is for budget travelers. I, I haven't done it, but that's just what I've heard. So yeah, the Dramamine and take the ship and hope it's the Drake Lake, like you said. <laughs> for sure. All right, we've got one last question we're gonna end on. So when you're on your overnight bus trips, I'm assuming there's a bathroom on the buses, but if not, um, do they stop or how do you normally handle that? Yeah, I think like 90% of the time they'll have a bus or um, a bathroom on the bus. Um, other than that, I think also 90% of the time the buses stop at some like McDonald's or some sort of rest stop and you can get out and use a proper bathroom if you also just prefer that to in like a bus bathroom. Um, so that's not too much of a concern. Um, and then I know you said this is the last question, but I also saw a question in the chat around like, how did I pay for all of this? And I think that's a question that I get a lot. So I'd love to address it. Yes, um, I didn't have to pay for college, thankfully, but I did pay for all of my trips myself. So the way that I was able to go about doing that really was through just like working really hard. Like I definitely had a very minimal amount of sleep during college. Um, I worked multiple jobs at once, um, always had an internship, whether it was every semester or every summer, I was always kind of working and grinding and earning extra money with the goal of being able to travel. Um, and honestly, I was able to save a lot of money by going abroad because at least for me, going to college in New York City is super expensive for housing given that it's New York City. So the cost of housing for me was so much cheaper if I was going to Italy or Singapore. Um, I, for example, like the average cost of let's say like an apartment somewhere in like the vicinity of NYU is like upwards of like $1,700 a month. But I only paid, I think it was like $2,000 for my whole semester in Singapore for the housing. So that was a drastic difference. Basically almost like one month of housing in New York was like five months in Singapore. And very similarly, I think the cost of housing in Florence when I lived abroad was half the cost of the housing in New York. So I ended up saving money by going abroad and being able to like redistribute that housing money that I would have gone towards housing to being able to travel and being able to experience different things. Um, so yeah, hope that answers that question. And also just through working a lot and like prioritizing that, like I didn't want to spend money on like clothes and things. I just wanted to focus on spending money on travel. Perfect. I love that priority. And then I love that you actually saved by traveling because it was cheaper over there. So. Yeah. Yes. And I might've missed it in the beginning, but what was the first year or semester that you actually did your first study abroad program? Um, so I guess it depends how you define study abroad. I went abroad to, as part of like a class trip with a professor in 
the spring of 2017 when I was a freshman. And that was my trip to Ghana that I mentioned earlier. And then I did my first semester abroad in the fall of 2017 when I was 19, went to Florence, Italy through NYU Florence. Okay, perfect. I just, I was so curious because I love that because I feel like so many people when they, which you and I were kind of talking a little bit about, if they do a study abroad program, maybe a lot of them might not do it till junior year or so, but I love that you, mm. you know, looked at these opportunities ahead of time and then kind of kept going with it. So, yeah, I would say that's, that's not super common as well. I know NYU is one of the schools that I know that lets people go abroad during sophomore year and actually specific maybe to my school within NYU it felt like if I didn't go abroad sophomore fall, like everyone would be abroad without me. It wasn't like I was the only one going. I think NYU is one of the schools or the school that sends the most students abroad out of any school in the US. So I definitely had positive peer pressure in that sense to be like, you're not gonna be missing out on anything on campus if you go abroad. Um, so that's something to consider as well. Like if you are at a stage where you're considering different universities to go to, or maybe if your kids are and they want to study abroad, I would say look for schools that have a high rate of studying abroad because often a big barrier, like some of my friends, like they love the concept of traveling and wish they could study abroad, but they were like, I just, I'd be the only one doing it. I feel like I'm going to miss out on a lot on campus and kind of that feeling of FOMO is something that you really have to deal with if you like want to do your own thing and kind of like break out of the molds of like a university that, that might not be as kind of study abroad crazy as NYU is. Mm -hmm such a good point but then you also have to flip it everyone needs to have the FOMO if they didn't go right that's what exactly I, that's what I always say I feel like even if you feel like you're missing out on campus like everyone else feels like they're missing out on your travels so don't worry about it exactly oh my goodness this is amazing you have been so wonderful to have here and like I said you are incredibly inspiring I can't wait to see where you go with this I'm so excited for your book I hope everyone can run out and pick it up and have a read. It's going to be wonderful. And I can't wait to hear about all your next adventures because you're going to be living this fun digital nomad life. So thank you for coming. I'm going to just share a couple more things regarding the nomadic network. But before I do, Caitlin, do you have anything else you'd like to add or say before I close this? No, nope, I think you covered it. But yeah, I guess also if anyone is interested, not only in like my historic travels that I document through my book, but like Going forward, I actually did quit my job recently to just be a traveler full time and like work on travel related entrepreneurship projects. So if you're kind of curious about the life of a digital nomad, feel free to follow me on Instagram. I definitely post very often about where I'm at in the world. <laughs> awesome. And I posted your um, info in our chat box so everyone can uh, uh, follow you along. So wonderful. Thank you again so much for being here and for all of you as well. And then just a couple things to note that we have coming up. So we have two more events this week. So tomorrow we have four epic ways to travel the world. This is with Planet D. Should be a wonderful presentation. They are very adventurous travelers. So um, definitely register for that if you're interested. And then if you have ever wanted to learn how to fly a drone and how to start using them easily, um, Christine is gonna be here on the 29th and she is a master at this. So. Definitely want to come take a look at that. And then our calendar is all the way through September, October, I believe. So you can go ahead and take a look at all the other events we have. There should be something there for everyone. And then as I mentioned, we have these monthly book clubs. So our August one on August 4th is with Scott at Scott Cheap's Flight. Scott's Cheap Flights, I'm sure you all know him. And so this will be wonderful. This is about Take More Vacations. We've got Lola coming to talk to us about her book on October 6th. And then I believe we just booked someone on September. So take a look at our calendar, the nomadicnetwork.com slash events for more info on all of those. And then as I mentioned, we have our Nomadic Net Plus com membership community where this is where we have the event replay, such as this one. They've just started doing monthly giveaways. So if you join, you might be up for winning something free. Matt will have live Q and A's and just a great way to connect with him. And there's an exclusive Facebook group where we can connect with everyone, just tons of different perks. So if that's something you're interested in, click on that link for just a couple dollars a month and you can have access to all of this great stuff. And that's it everyone. Thank you so much for being here today and being a part of the TNN travel community. Thank you, Caitlin, for sharing everything. And thank you to all of you for your great questions. So we couldn't do this without you. And hopefully we will see you all maybe later this week or in the next month or so at some of our upcoming events. So have a wonderful rest of your day or evening, wherever you are. And we will see you all soon. Thank you.